Thank you very much. I have a difficult surname and I have a very difficult title as well. So Femme Theogenic, people have asked me what is it. It's feminine and entheogenic. Uh, entheogenic because again people have asked me what is it. It's psychedelic. Psychedelic is mind manifesting. Entheogenic is um, God manifesting. I'm dropping the psychedelic because it has a lot of connotations and it has a lot of um, karma that comes with it. And I think we need to think about the substances with a fresh mind. We need new terms. Um, so even though I think psychedelic is spot on, um, I think it carries quite a lot with it. So femtogenic consciousness invoking a connection with the world soul. And I'd like to start with talking about the feminine and considering the goddess, because the goddess is uh, a very complex creature. She's not a one-dimensional entity. And I'd like to take some time to consider her various faces and her various facets. I like to think of her as a crystal with various surfaces reflected by the light, because the more we hold the crystal under the light and the more we move around it, the more of its color and depth illuminates through. And it's the same with the goddess. The more we connect with who she is and the more we take time to have a look at her, the more of her depth unfolds before us. And it takes time to really see the goddess because she's very elusive and she's wrapped in veils of mystery. But if we remove the veils of mystery, we come to recognize that she's very relevant to everyone, to all of us, because the feminine is an elemental pattern that we all carry within ourselves, whether we're men or women. And we also come to recognize it's very relevant to everything around us because the feminine is the one half of the divine androgen. And the divine androgen is the deepest archetype that flows through creation. So in talking about the feminine today, I'm talking about her archetypal aspect because it has a stronger force and charge than the personal aspect. So the personal aspect is perhaps your own mother, but the archetypal aspect is the great mother or the great goddess or uh, the Virgin Mary. As an archetype, the feminine is always and ever present. She speaks to us in many languages and she speaks to us individually, she speaks to us collectively. But while she's never absent, we very often fail to know, acknowledge her or even notice her because we've forgotten how to recognize the goddess in our days and we've forgotten how to hear her daily whispers. And today we have reduced her great depth into a very flat version of womanhood. Gareth Hill is a Jungian analyst. He's done a lot of work around the feminine and the masculine. And I'm going to borrow some of his work around the feminine today because he has managed to map out the most essential qualities and the great depth of the feminine by dividing her in two aspects, the static aspect and the dynamic aspect. The static feminine is linked to motherhood and nourishment. She holds within her body deep primal secrets of creation. She's able to conceive the potential of life and give birth to it. And there she participates in the greatest mystery of life on earth. That mystery is the ability to manifest the soul into material form. But we've forgotten how great that mystery is today and we've just reduced it to very dry medical terms. But in that mystery, the feminine is the embodiment of creation and regeneration. And it's that link to regeneration that makes the feminine very central for our collective healing processes. Woman magic and earth magic have always been linked. They both create and they both nourish life. And it's the static feminine that's linked to nature. Here, the feminine is impersonal. She's in harmony with nature and she preserves the collective goals of life on earth. And these are species preservation and survival. For our ancestors, that link between the feminine and earth at first was a great point of worship until gradually man tried to control suppress and manipulate both and he created a very deep imbalance in his relationship with both these forces. The dynamic feminine is very different. She's very hard to pin down. She's very hard to put into words. The dynamic feminine free flows and she forms according to what fate and destiny brings her way. So she's very intuitive and she's very responsive. She engages with direct experience and she reaches through to knowledge that belong to the deep inner worlds. 
a few examples of her force, we can sense her when we see children playing. It's part of that authentic, spontaneous way of being. We can see her behind the chaos of the forest floor. She has that link to the regenerative aspect of chaos. And she's also the force behind all evolution. She's part of that uh, creative synthesis where new possibilities come out of. Now, the spaces the dynamic feminine represents can be ecstatic, they can, they can be fascinating, but they can also be disorienting and frightening. And these are spaces that, as a society, we've tended to avoid, resist, and probably completely ignore. That has left the feminine without priestesses in our society. And in the absence of her guides, she meets us in the lands of the unconscious and the realms of altered consciousness through dreams, meditation, active imagination, holotropic breathwork and theogenic journeys, the feminine can offer her transformative energies to us that link our matter to our soul and support the expansion of our consciousness. But again, the West does not know how to decipher and translate the symbolic, archaic speech of dreams and imagination. And her guidance goes again unnoticed. In our culture, we understand language. Uh, language is a masculine principle. It's the rational and ordered container of experience. The lands beyond that space belong to the feminine. And that's where we meet that, which is usually beyond words. The myths we've held the feminine in have controlled her essence, have drained her enormous strength and energy. And it's the same, same with the words we've held the, the feminine in. They have... Um, driven her underground. So we've labeled the feminine emotional, uh, hysterical, melodramatic, chaotic, subjective. And by linking her, by, by holding her in these words, we've linked her with energies that our society has always feared and tried to control. But the word feminine stands for the soul. The word feminine is a reference for the threads that connect us to each other and to the rest of creation. It is a reference for our interconnectedness. It is a reference for our place within a sacred order. The archetypal feminine is a reference for our link to ourselves, for our link to life, and for our link to the divine. The archetypal feminine is also extremely, fully, deeply, madly psychedelic. She shares entheogenic qualities that can heal, transform, and support the expansion of our consciousness. These shared qualities, these points of contact between the feminine and antigens have also been major points of suppression for both. Because these are qualities that go against the grain for our, our regular Western mindset. In the Garden of Eden, Eve took a bite of the apple from the sacred tree of knowledge. This was a mythos that repressed both the feminine and expanded awareness into sin within our consciousness and merged them with the shadow side. This was the point humanity fell into duality. Up until that point, the badness or the wrongness was somewhere out there and it was carried by a snake. But from that point onwards, humanity got wrapped in it. This was a paradox that had no solution. We were either in the garden or out of it. Mythologically, this was the point our ego developed. To leave the garden was to become aware, and that is self-aware. Up until that point, we lived in the unconscious Eden. We have since kept femtogenic consciousness in exile. We have systematically maintained its inferiority, and we've seen them as uh, destructive forces that we've tried to control. The feminine and antigens have been repressed because their force and their energy could not be assimilated by our species. We have distorted both to a diabolical form and we've seen them as very dangerous and very seductive forces. So what is this shared space that the feminine and antigens share and what are these femtogenic teachings I'm going on about? So one of the major insights um, femtogenic consciousness opens us up to is the awareness of connectedness and oneness. For centuries, we've been caught in the illusion of separateness. And that has alienated us from Earth, it has alienated us from each other, and it has alienated us from the deepest nature of who we are, of ourselves. In our state of separateness, we have separated everything. We've separated creation from creator and spirit from nature. We've forgotten that nature is not something out there, but nature is really what we're made of. And we no longer see the world as sacred. In our state of separateness, we see the world as a series of hierarchical relations. And our species is, of course, in the dominator's position. 
that leaves us in a very narcissistic place. And from that narcissistic bubble, all we can really recognize in the mirrors of the world around us is ourselves and our own needs. We have come to believe that our needs entitle us to control and manipulate all natural resources. And the outcome of that is that we've created a huge crisis that's social, it's uh, environmental, and it's certainly spiritual. The femtogenic message is clear, we are one. Um, that oneness is a spiritual connection, it's the reflections we emit to each other. We're all mirrors of our shared humanity. But that oneness is not just a metaphysical idea, it's what chaos theorists have called the butterfly effect, where a butterfly flaps its wings on one continent and weeks later creates a hurricane in another continent. It's the one as we see in the effects of deforestation, industrialization, the effects the consuming greed of the West has on the East. It's a very real and direct experience of the world around us that it seems like we're becoming more and more aware of. And that invisible space of connectedness that reveals to us, uh, that femtogenic consciousness reveals to us, at its core has eros and love. And to recognize this is to awaken to one of the greatest forces in the universe. The next femtogenic link is boundary dissolving experiences. Um, as I've already said, our societies are based on divisive lines that maintain the illusion of separateness. And the most frightening boundary to cross is the disillusion of the ego. The ego is a huge machine, and our whole current social illusion is based on it. As a concept in itself, it's been a big part of our evolution, and it can have many useful functions. What's dysfunctional is our need to hold on to our ego. Because the ego needs to undergo many deaths if it is to evolve if we are to evolve into a more authentic version of who we are, we need to peel through the layers in order to reach through to the core. Motherhood is a fundamental experience of boundary dissolution. The other is contained within oneself. And that's not just a, a physical experience of a boundary dissolution, because that's a symbiotic bond that extends way beyond the birthing process. It's the same with entheogens. They are based on the dissolution of boundaries on ver various levels. In these spaces, the divisive lines between us and other uh, past, present, and future, conscious, unconscious, masculine, feminine, they all dissolve. And that's the most frightening aspect of anthogenic journeys for individuals and for the general status quo. And that's where the great goddess and anthogenic journeys deliver us to. It's a point where in order to evolve and transform, uh, we need to transcend our own boundaries and in that process be released from our false selves. The next femtogenic link is chaos. We've tried to tame chaos for centuries because we've believed it to be our greatest survival threat. It's not always been like that. We've had a couple of lucid points in history. Uh, the early alchemists and the early Gnostics recognized chaos as a vital element in the creative process of transformation. But today, we relate to chaos as a state of disintegration and no longer a stage of transformation. Um, our ancestors linked feminine with nature. They gradually saw nature as a chaotic force that needed to be controlled and mastered. They reflected that onto the feminine. And that's how our dysfunctional, unconscious link between the feminine and chaos got installed. But as I've already said, in the form of the dynamic feminine, the feminine has a very creative link with chaos. And that's with the regenerative aspects of chaos. That's with chaos as a force of transformation. Entheogens embrace chaos and the transformative potential, and they teach us it is a very valued stage in our process of becoming. During a deep entheogenic journey, we're taken apart and we're then put back together. Chaos gives birth to order, that's more complex than before, and that's a step further in our evolutionary journey. A big part of what has driven our relationship with nature, feminine and anthrogen's underground is our collective difficulty to be with chaos. And femtogenic consciousness has the capacity to revive that relationship in ways that are quite meaningful. The next femtogenic link is the vital cycles of life, death and rebirth. For our ancestors, the, the feminine powers of fertility and birth were seen as a symbol that they recognized the nature in its cycles of life, death, and rebirth. And they learned from nature that death is not an end in itself. Death is a stage of regeneration. Uh, 
Today, we relate to death with dread. We are unable to relate to it in depth and, and, and connect to its essence. We are all involved in a collective denial of, of death and, and its reality. But the goddess that gives life is the goddess that takes life. Creation gives place to destruction. Destruction that's in service to life is meant to give place to creation. The archetypal feminine goddess Kali is a powerful symbol of that wisdom. Kali is a goddess that's in constant movement. She creates to destroy and she destroys to create. And she is indifferent to our ego's demands for survival. Kali is a goddess that sees no opposites. For her, all is one, whether that's life or death. We can only recover our deep inner treasures by facing the dark side of the archetypal <coughs> goddess, and that's the dark side of the archetypal feminine, the devourer and the transformer. And it's the same with anthogenic journeys, the most profound journeys that people report the most lasting and significant changes from are the ones that unfold within a supportive set and setting, and I have to emphasize that, but they unfold into the ultimate spiritual experience of ego death. Femtogenic consciousness um, has, has creates that potential for us to escape our ego just for a second and receive a wisdom that necessitates death and even welcomes it. I'm not saying that uh, loss, death, chains are not painful transition portals. They really are. But uh, this is about a wider understanding that femtogenic consciousness can teach us. And it says it's our ego that grieves. On a soul level, things are very different. On a soul level, we know that every end is nothing but a drop in a very vast ocean. The next femtogenic link relates to time. Now, time is a major construct in our society. I always run out of it. We see it as a very fixed and, and static thing. Uh, but the feminine rhythms of regeneration reveal timelessness. The goddess of birth contains a soul that moves through various birth canals. She participates in a mystery that intersects time. It goes beyond time. And it's the same with anthogenic spaces. They reveal to us again timelessness. Within a journey, we're being shown mysteries that defy our logic. We're, we're allowed to move through past, present, and future in the most extraordinary ways. So femtogenic consciousness allows us to witness and experience a very different sense and quality of time. Creativity, patriarchy has tried to suppress our creative forces by focusing on the mind and the logic. But femtogenic consciousness supports the creative dimension of our evolution. The feminine is the creative matrix for our species, and that's a major link to creativity. So it's connected to the patterns that belong to the wider rules and laws of creation. Anthogens are highly creative spaces. They speak to us through images, through symbols, through feeling states, and these are carried forward by visions. These visions create metaphors that allow us to connect to that which is beyond words or beyond immediate perception. But in our society, we have failed to acknowledge the creative and healing potential these creative states have. And we've only seen them as very dangerous, destructive, and chaotic states. I have mentioned femtogenic wisdom quite a bit implicitly and explicitly. And I'm referring to a very particular kind of knowing that we have ignored for a very long time. Femtogenic knowing is intuitive, it's non-linear, and it's informed by the creative source. Femtogenic knowing has the capacity to reach through to the invisible, and that includes the um, unswept, dark corners of our psyche. And that's where our shadow lives. To claim our shadow and to claim our darkness is to cultivate compassion for ourselves and in reflection for others. This is where we face the limitations of who we are, of our human experience and our human nature. And this is where the heart can actually start working on forgiveness. This is a very reflective space. And this space is the land of paradox. Light and dark here collaborate. And the aim is to heal our psychic divides and our psychic splits. Femtogenic consciousness can open us up to uh, spontaneous, instinctive, and authentic ways of living. Um, in trying to protect ourselves from our impermanence and our lack of control, we've learned to perceive reality in the world as concrete. This concreteness has um, created a safety, but it can also lead to staticness, to staleness, and ultimately deadness, which is ironically the very thing our egos are trying to avoid. 
we operate from a state of doing and we find it very hard to experience a state of being. But the feminine is not bounded by rules or order. The feminine essence exists in a freedom that's um, full of potential. It's the same with anthogenic spaces. By dissolving our egos, uh, they allow us to die and rebirth infinite times within a journey. And that shakes away our social masks and it helps us question the unquestionable. So who will become under the guidance of femtogenic consciousness can be far wider and broader than what the stagnant social matrix ever allow us to imagine. The final link, of course, is the unconscious. Now, for Jungian analysts, consciousness was always associated with the masculine, and the unconscious has always been the terrain of the feminine. And as we've already seen, it's the dynamic feminine that has the link with this invisible symbolic spaces in our psyche and she communicates this through to us through dreams imagination and altered states of consciousness it's the same with anthogenic journeys they bring unconscious material into consciousness and they allow us a glimpse of our undercurrent realms femtogenic consciousness creates the potential and, and it's only a potential until it's realized for our conscious and unconscious selves to meet and integrate. And that's huge. That paves a way for our psychological journey towards wholeness. So I have called it consciousness because how we relate to these concepts can have a profound effect on how we relate to life and the world around us and how we experience the world around us. And of course can have a profound effect on our moral and ethical values. Now, femtogenic consciousness, as I said, can support our collective healing process and our individual healing process. But for that to happen, we need to revive the true and deeper essence from our unconscious. Because patriarchy has suppressed these forces deep into our unconscious. Patriarchy is a paranoid state of consciousness. And it tries to suppress anything that holds any potential for power or anything that uh, threatens its structures. And it has actively waged the war against both the feminine and anthrogens. Patriarchy, unfortunately, is not just a faulty logic. It's not just thinking on wrong. If we sit around the table and have a chat, we won't find a way through because patriarchy is a power system and it takes very strong and resilient movements if it's ever to be truly challenged. What patriarchy does is it creates and maintains inequalities. It actively creates and maintains and promotes unjust social relations. It tries to suppress any true form of individualism and it teaches us to believe that our value as a person is linked to our position in its system. We believe it, we play the game, uh, we adopt a false self, we adopt a false self-idealization and we are getting fooled into believing that we actually are who we appear to be. But patriarchy is not synonymous with masculinity today. Patriarchy is a collective responsibility. Women can act as divisive dominators just as much. We're all part of a culture that attacks nature and the feminine in all of us. And we all have to delve deep within ourselves and ask ourselves, where, where am I playing a part of this? When have I obscured her essence? I'll give you an example. I work with young women today. And... Um, I work with young people, young women often come to the space as a therapist and it's incredible how often they bring their narrative and somewhere in their narrative there's this space that says something like, um, I don't like women, um, I'd rather hang out with the boys, um, women are bitches, they'll backstab you, I don't trust them or I don't like them. And it's incredible that they're not aware they're, they're feminine themselves and what they say reveals how they feel about themselves and how they feel about their own nature. Um, these young women have really taught me how deeply ingrained our gender belief systems are that teach us that men are cooler and better friends to have, more intelligent uh, and that women have very little to offer in return. And that might be true to some extent, because we have dissected the feminine today and we've thrown all her essential elements away. We've lost our knowledge to her ancient mystery traditions. We've lost our connection to that. We've denied her wisdom in the rational world we have surrounded ourselves with. Uh, we've maintained uh, feminine values that scratch the surface, things like sexual attractiveness, and, and this is what we teach young women to look up for. So patriarchy and its children, and that includes all of us to a bigger or lesser extent, we do not know the goddess. We've misunderstood her potential and we've, we have 
misunderstood the power of her links to the very fabric of life. Now, patriarchy has also attacked men in its um, attack on the feminine, and it has really alienated them. It has alienated men by devaluing the feminine, patriarchy has alienated men from the feminine within themselves because the feminine is an elemental pattern. We all hold it within ourselves, whether we're men or women. But patriarchy has also alienated men from the feminine outside themselves by splitting them between their need to idealize the feminine and their need to control and dominate the feminine. And they haven't been able to bridge that gap in between. The persecution of the feminine has been a cultural neurosis that us humans have indul indulged in for, for centuries. Um, and I'm going to refer to a very well-known example, the witch hunts. I chose that because it was a time where women and herbs were once again thought of as evil. And uh, the witch hunt is a very well-known example that illustrates what lies beneath patriarchy. Now, the witch hunts were between the 14th and the 17th century. Millions of women were killed in that time. In that time, husbands accused their wives to the Inquisition of having erotic encounters with demon lovers that satisfied them more than they could. So in that state of collective madness, uh, the inquisitors would visit the women, strip search them, and look for the devil's mark. And those that did carry the devil's mark were either uh, hanged or burned at the stake. The inquisitors believed that witchcraft comes from sexual lust, and they saw the feminine sexual lust as a powerful and frightening force that linked her to the devil. The witch hunt is one example amongst many that show us that what lies beneath patriarchal domination is men seduced by power and threatened by the thought that someone else out there might have a bigger and more potent penis than their own. So that threat of impotence and death, instead of being faced and worked through, it's been repressed and it's been acted out in various forms of aggression, violence, rage, and that unfortunately includes warfare. But the ironic outcome of repression is that what is suppressed out of fear reemerges in the form of its repression. This is not about the absence of the feminine because the feminine or the masculine can never be absent. These are elemental patterns that will always flow through. This is about the distortion of the feminine that has exaggerated the tragic imbalance between the two. This imbalance is bringing us near to a possible collapse and possible extinction. Death has not been held at bay. Death has been elicited in an indirect way because in our disconnected intellect, we have raped the earth we live on, we have um, destroyed the intricate balance of our planet, we have created phallic missiles of mass destruction, and we have disguised the impotence of patriarchy as power that expresses itself in genocidal behavior. Now, in Jungian psychology, the ultimate goal of development is individuation, that's the growth into one's full potential. And we cannot individuate unless we integrate our shadow. Patriarchy has repressed the feminine into our collective shadow. And unless we integrate and revive her essence and bring it into balance with the masculine, we will continue to carry out our neurotic fantasies. We will continue to endanger our survival on this planet. Um, Patriarchy has also had a little bit of problem with psychedelics. Uh, patriarchy cannot tolerate psychedelics, and psychedelics cannot tolerate patriarchy. Patriarchy has traditionally favored substances that um, maintain boundaries, create a mindless state, and support the general status quo. Uh, Terence McKenna has written, of course, about the link between the ban of antigens, the rise of patriarchy and the suppression of the sacred feminine, as he's called it. And he's also outlined the links between states of consciousness and production line. So he has fam famously said, um, during a lunch break, you, you're always encouraged to have a coffee break. And it's true, in my place, it's for free, the coffee. But you would never be encouraged to have a pot break, even if it was legal, because, of course, that would throw production out of the window. So the substances we're favoring today, alcohol, sugar, um, caffeine, are um, implicit in maintaining a system that um, we're all part of to a greater or lesser degree. Anthrogens, on the other hand, they dissolve boundaries and they make us question what it all means, why things are as they are, and they usually help us consider alternatives that are more planet and people friendly. They offer us a wider lens that we can examine reality through and they cut through our cultural conditioning. 
they catalyze imagination, they catalyze the expansion of our consciousness. But more importantly for me here today, they revive the broken feminine and they filter all her energy through to us. It was during that time of the 50s and 60s that a new moral compass started to emerge and it was under the psychedelic expansions of that wave of psychedelia that uh, forms of oppression were questioned. It was the time that the feminist movement and the ecological movement emerged and these are seeds that are still growing today. Ensurgents make the maintenance of very rigid, static, hierarchical structures unsustainable and that's a major threat for patriarchy. Patriarchy has responded to the threat by making us believe um, that the use of entities is an immoral and antisocial threat and it has validated the criminal persecution of cognitive liberty which is the freedom to alter or enhance one's consciousness. Now femtogenic consciousness again I'll repeat, it's essential for the revival of our uh, political, our social, our economic, our spiritual and our environmental systems. Um, and I think we'll all agree that we all sense it's, it's certainly a time of crisis. On an individual level, our levels of unhappiness are immense and our narcissism leaves us powerless, paranoid and with very low self-esteem. We have neglected our hearts, we've deprived ourselves from the sanctuary of community and relationships, and we lead our lives increasingly more from cyberspace, which is where our false self thrives. So we remove ourselves further and further away from any true knowledge of ourselves. Um, in that state of alienation, we give in more and more to diseases of the mind and diseases of the body. But nothing exists in isolation, as femtogenic consciousness knows and teaches us all too well. Our individual psyches reflect onto our societies, and our individual crises translate to a horrifying social crisis. Our societies are based on consumerism and materialism that we refuse to moderate. Uh, our postmodern deities are the dollar, the euro, the pound, and the yen. We, in our target-driven madness, we have forgotten how to honor and support our elders and we have completely abandoned our youth to the mercy of very ruthless media that shrink their souls and neglect the development of their highest potential. Uh, we're facing overpopulation, we're facing tragic issues such as hunger, water shortages, uh, the spread of infectious diseases, sanitation in various parts of the world and we're not effectively addressing this. Our individual and our social crisis extends to the ecology around us. We have ravaged our rainforests, we have overfished and depleted our seas, we have contaminated our rivers, we have excavated our mountains and our ever increasing demands for food and technology are depleting Earth's natural resources. Our exploitation of Earth is amounting to ecocide as we are disrupting ecosystems that life depends on and our ecocidal tendencies are linked to our genocidal tendencies as we're waging wars on the basis of diminishing resources. On the positive side, <laughs> <laughs> the moment of crisis is always a potential moment of deep transformation. We have to face our darkness before the old solidified ego boundaries can be shattered and through the cracks the possibility of something new may emerge. We're threading a very thin line and transformation is always based on the tension of opposites. On one hand, we have the potential for evolution by integrating very powerful forces, social and intrapsychic forces. On the other hand, there's the possibility of disintegration and social regression into the worst possible scenarios of our human nature. In that time of rebirth, dark forces come awake and the recent rise of fascism across Europe is an one such example. Such forces have the power to disempower and threaten our visions and they can reassert the existing status quo. For our ancestors, nature was very powerful. She was the great goddess. She was powerful and vital. That was one of our earliest collective blueprints on the nature of God. As the sun god replaced the earth goddess, we lost our connection with nature and we lost our link with the most profound source of life and wisdom. 
that divine source of knowledge, that world of the soul, was once known as Anima Mundi. Anima Mundi was a space that held the knowledge that there's consciousness within matter. Anima Mundi was the spirit that lived within the center of every living thing, and our ancestors used sacred ritual to activate this light. Now, today we recognize Anima Mundi as a concept because we no longer live a life that's aligned to its principles. We have become alienated from the aliveness of the world, and we've forgotten how to activate this light or relate to that light within nature, but also within ourselves. As a result, we've disconnected from our creative and imaginative potential. We've lost touch with the magic stuff. Meditations, mantras, breathing exercises, anthogenic journeys, they all activate aspects of the inner technology we have as a species. They all belong to the magical side of the human experience. To reconnect with that side is to reconnect with the anima mundi. And to reconnect with the anima mundi is to regain a reflection and connection with our own soul. In that space, there's been a lot of talk about the return of the divine feminine. The return of the divine feminine is essentially a new mythology about the expansion of our consciousness. It talks of a shift in our relationships towards nature, the planet, and our own bodies. To release the goddess is to upgrade our operational systems from the head centers to the inclusion of our hearts. Her return can support us in disempowering some of our self-destructive tendencies. Uh, she is a force that speaks to us. If only we can be receptive to the pool of consciousness that surrounds her, and if only we can become more receptive to her daily whispers. The masculine and the feminine are the fundamental archetypal energies that make up the entire universe. We're being called to create new mythologies. We're being called to create mythologies that integrate the lunar feminine wisdom with the solar masculine consciousness. A healthy future needs to be balanced by the divine androgen because at this point we're threading towards evolution. Evolution is not a matter of physicality for us at this point. It's not about a bigger size brain or a new body development. Evolution at this point for our species is a matter of interiority. We have to go within and find out who we are away from our social personas. This is not about having insights. This is about change. And change means that we need to die to our jobs. We need to die to our faith. We need to die to our relationships. We need to die to our old selves. And anything that no longer serves the truest freedom of our deepest selves Every one of these deaths is a sacred initiation for the emergence of our true self. Because to enter the core is to activate the light that lives within the center of every living thing. And to enter the core is to activate the anima mundi within ourselves. Women, antigens, and nature can only be released after social revolution can bring about structural change. There is revolt. There is expression of that wish, sometimes expressed directly and sometimes indirectly, like an ingrown nail. But nations around the world are trying to shed away the expired political systems and the archaic sociopolitical complexes. We are all seeking greater truth and greater freedom, and we're all trying to see through the smoke of eons. We're one step away from assuming responsibility, and that's where our true fr freedom really lies. Femtogenic consciousness can support the emergence and development of a planetary consciousness. Our crisis is a crisis of consciousness. The world soul is suffering. We are suffering. We need to remember the world's wounds and imbalances are our own wounds and imbalances. First, we need to rescue our own souls. And that's how we participate in the mystery of oneness. Now, for these strong energies to transform, we need the strong container of the goddess. And anthogens are a powerful channel of the feminine voice and the feminine essence. They realign us to our core, and they remind us of the divine purpose of being alive. In anthogenic spaces, we can actually meet the possibility for wholeness. In transformation, for me, the message is one. Changes are like ripples. They start small and they grow big. They begin within and they certainly spread without. So we need to be mindful of what we cultivate and what we offer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions?
questions, any comments, any... Yes, please, and then, yeah. Um, uh, I've got like a random research point and a question. Yeah, um, go on. Research, millions of women weren't killed during the early modern period. There's a figure made up by Margaret Murray in the early okay. century. Mm -hmm. And it also doesn't take into account that many, many men and animals were also killed. But yeah. But from a much smaller figure. I'm, I'm sure it is, but this is yeah. focusing on the feminine. When I said, you know, I talked about Gareth Hill, I said I'll only focus on the feminine here because it's yeah, oh yeah, really well, linked in. Yeah, yeah. Really Frank. Yeah. Thank you for integrating. <laughs> yeah. Um, the question is, could you say a little more about the relationship between uh, chaos and the uh, fem theodemic? Fem uh, yeah, okay. Fem theodemic. Okay. Uh, well, the feminine, because what I've done is, you know, I've given the blurb and then I've linked it with the feminine and then the entheogens. Is there any of the two in particular? Well, it's uh, mainly, well, you're saying that the chaos has become this, uh, nowadays, just this disintegration. Yes. Yes, and it's a force of regeneration. Yeah. So yeah. Is that the element in itself that's been lost? Is that the feminine element? That, that is, well, the, there's a distortion in what has been assigned to the feminine. But, uh, yeah, the, the, the suppression of the feminine has been based on our difficulty with chaos. But gnostics and alchemists, and, and, you know, the alchemists and their alchemical transformations, they show the chaos states, the negredo states, the dark states of becoming as really vital for actually producing form. Today we think, oh shit, don't want to do this, that doesn't really work, but it's um, the prima materia, it, it's, it's the space where all life and all possibilities can emerge from, so it's full, it's, it's impregnated with potential, but we've lost our connection with that potential and we only want to separate from it. It also reminds of death and we don't want to have anything to do with that. There's a potential, all potential carries dark potential as well and, and we really want to disconnect with that because it, it brings terrible defences in us. Does that yeah. an answer? But we can talk about it more as well. Maria, first of all, thank you for this thank beautiful you. talk. Yeah, really helpful. Thank you for listening all yeah. this time. <laughs> you know, I, I, I have a um, more practical question. What if the dynamic feminine is the more dominant part mm -hmm. and you have this imbalance that is really, you know, you're very chaotic, mm -hmm. and, you know, all these things you've mm. mentioned. Um, what would you then uh, suggest to in order to re mm. su suppress mm. it a little bit or balance it better? Okay, know? okay. So well, it <laughs> 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 okay. Well, you know, on, on a practical, personal level, I would imagine that grounding practices would be useful, like meditation. Is that what you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, you know, practices <laughs> like meditation and and and, and <laughs> contemplative. <laughs> practices might really ground you or, or you know simple things like regular routines of eating and sleeping and keeping a, a lead on on how your chaos unfolds but it depends whether you see more chaos in particular areas of your life than others it's about really questioning really encountering really creating a relationship with it i i would even write about it but it's an energy you know it's, it's a fantastic energy um it's about channeling it properly you're right but um yeah, if you need to, but on a very practical, down-to-earth way, grounding practices that can actually bring balance, I would imagine, off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, on the other hand, can you recommend any practices to uh, en enhance uh, like the fem fem theogenic consciousness within yourself? Ah. Like specific practices. Psychedelics? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I think, I think it starts with awareness. It starts with integrating something from that that actually resonates and makes sense for you. I think it starts from a place within, not necessarily a place that's a mind place. And I think that's the whole thing about the feminine. It's not a mind place, it's an intuitive place. Yeah. Cultivate your creative side, cultivate your intuitive side, don't shut it out with masculine no's and judgments and needing to, po you know, it's about allowing that feminine energy to be with you in your altered states of consciousness, but definitely in your ordinary states of consciousness and recognizing the value this state can have um, for you in your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yes, please. Um, you said um, we, we all have this uh, female equality. Ye uh, yes. Men. Yes. Then. Sorry. So, um, <laughs> 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 my question is: um, Are there things in w the world uh, maybe only women are able to do in this world, and where are the limits of men? Mm. So mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, you wanted more. Uh, <laughs> yes, listen, on, on an elemental level, you mentioned childbirth, and the other one for the women is ejaculation. You know, th these are the two theories that go on a, on a Hardcore, real, elemental level, men can never witness in, in their body as an experience the, the reality of childbirth. And for women, the equivalent that they say is on a real elemental level, they can never have the experience of male ejaculation. Now, I don't know why that's different from female, but that's what's out there. That there's this real baseline that actually belongs to either or, but um, we are a mixture, and we are a mixture of this and that. Um, there's also the, you know, the, um, I mean, Jung talked a lot about the man within a woman and the woman within a man, and he called it animus and anima, and that's the whole field of attraction. You're uh, attracted to a person because they hold an aspect of your inner man, if you're a woman, or an aspect of your inner woman. If, but that gets quite messy and complicated. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, these are forces that are elemental. You know, Like I said, they make up the entire universe. Um, there's no creation without a bit of both. And then in two, there's actually four because you hold both, that person holds both, and it's quite a mixture in terms of dynamics. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hi. First of all, I want to thank you, Maria. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> 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 the clapping time. <laughs> general daily conversation about needing this feminine revolution, mm -hmm. this uh, divine feminine revolution. Mm -hmm. Men are encouraged, if not coerced, into being softer, being mm -hmm. more feminine, mm -hmm. and rejecting. There's a prohibition on traditional male roles, traditional yeah. male behavior, traditional male archetypes. Mm -hmm. And there's also, at the same time, women that are basically flipping the dominator mm -hmm. paradigm, mm -hmm. so that they're simply carrying along their boy toys and their very submissive boyfriends that mm. don't speak and take their last name and all this mm. <laughs> Take <laughs> the last name. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> say it, Charles. <laughs> so, I mean, what's going on there in that, in that phenomenon? Mm. Uh, well, what are we seeing there? And, and how, you know, maybe explain a little bit of how that happened and what mm. we do about that. Yeah, it's defensive. Yeah, it, it's defensive. And, and it can flip. When we have defenses, we can flip either side. It's, uh, it's about, um, um, let me find an example. Like, um, you have a trauma. I'll talk to you in terms of, you have a trauma. And in order to manage that trauma, you... Um, you pull yourself to directions that have nothing to do with it. I'm not explaining it very well. Um, it's like you're seeking out uh, some mirror reflection of your shadow to work the shit out. But it's almost like you are becoming what you were subjected to. Exactly. It's very much like the, the victim becomes the oppressor. Yes, in order to feel in a more safe or, or sustainable position. But we can never adopt either or. In reality, Charles, we flip constantly, whether we're aware of it or not. We can never hold firmly into a position. We might think we do, and that might be comforting, but that's not possible. Um, but under the measure of what this gentleman over here said, like, <coughs> you know, explain to us ideally what a balanced male would look like. And 
Like what? A balanced female. Yeah, it would be great if there was a generic term, but I think it's not about a balanced male or a balanced female, although yes, absolutely possible. It is about a balanced dynamic. And I think that's the space that's really important. It is about a balanced relationship between the two. It's about acknowledging the maleness and allowing it and giving it space and, and honor and allowing the feminine and giving it space and honor. And I think what I'm saying is that as a society, we've upheld a lot of uh, male uh, belief systems or ways of being and a lot of feminine ways of, of experiencing the world have been denied from us. And that's not just women, that's also men. So we've created these societies that reflect mostly, there's a great imbalance. So it's, you know, a balanced male, but I, I would think about it as a balanced person, whether they're male or female. I think there's loads of things into the mix, but it's about how do this communicate? How do this coexist in, in, in a place that we, we can get the most out of it? Does that make sense? Sure. I'm really <laughs> glad. I don't want you on my back. <laughs> yes. Referring to the, the static part of femininity, uh, yep. I question, do you think uh, that uh, the, uh, the development that uh, women uh, more and more take part uh, in the killing part of wars, mm. which is exactly the opposite to giving birth and uh, creating yep. Absolutely. It's, uh, more or less uh, um, something like an intentional distraction in order to mm. make us uh, conscious uh, for, for, for the um, divinity between the two sexes, or, mm. is, it, or, or is it an arbitrary uh, evolution plan? Mm. I, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it, it's uh, again, I, I go back to defense. I think it's what I said about the women I see in my space. I think over centuries, women have had to drop their femininity because actually it brings them in a place that's very vulnerable, it's denied, it's rejected. And women adopt male values. You know, I've had worse, um, more, more domineering feminine managers at times than male managers. It's, it's about actually acquiring a place of safety. And where are you safer? In male boots in this world. What language do you need to speak? Male language in this world. If you play the game, you're all right. And for a lot of women, it's a lot easier to do that and disconnect from their true nature than actually stay where they are. Well, um, the uh, female warriors mm. in the past, mm. North, Norse mythology and things like that, you have mm. women who are exactly the same standard as the men, mm. in different respects of balance, but more than but they were equally as powerful as yeah, they were part of societies. Yeah. They I were mean, part they of were structures. Yeah, their, their fellow man and yeah, their and they would mm. each other. Mm. But this is not a very recent phenomenon. What's happening? That inequality is a very, very old phenomenon. You know, we have, like I said, we have mythologies that start from the dawn of time that mm. actually are already tweaking things in many the ways. Uh, the horror of Babylon, the book of Revelation states, is our earth goddess. Tell me more about that. <laughs> Tell me more I about that. I just say, it's, you have this, you know, it's this male patriarchy belief system of the mm. Abrahamic religions. Okay. Which dominate women. Okay. And then, and to make her the witch, and to make her to the, the evil. Yeah. But actually... In the book of Revelations, mm -hmm. the great hall of Babylon, she rises up, you know, of course she loses, I guess. In Potent the and, and, and uh, okay. Hell, but she fights well, her battle. You know, it's quite, but it's that yeah. feminine consciousness that's rising. Okay. And I'm just wondering if that's okay. you know, how you I don't know about <laughs> it, so I'll have a look yeah. and, and I'll think about it. Yeah. I won't take it and run with it because <laughs> I'll just be talking. <laughs> Thank One you. short practical question. Okay. Practical again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when, it, when, it, when it's the opposite, yeah. that means the male energy is dominant. Should we then take a lot of psychedelics in order to balance it? You could. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't <laughs> stop you. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, you know, I mean, f for me, psychedelics is a fast track. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing for me. Psychedelics, yeah, are definitely a fast track. They get you to a place where you can um, 
reconfigure your psychic components in a very quick way. There's many other ways, and there's ways that suit some people and ways that suit other people. Um, I have certainly had encounters in, in my psychedelic journeys where um, I have to consider both my male and my feminine side. No, 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 I, I, I heard the statement earlier today, chemicals, non-chemicals, no, I, I don't actually. I do have certain things I'm not very close to and, and they don't draw me. That would be something like ketamine or, you know, it's, it's substances that haven't drawn me, but they've drawn other people. But no, I think it's really whatever spirit calls you and works with you, fantastic, yeah. Um, I think there's a, yeah, I think there's a core of psychedelic values and I think there's a core of psychedelic morals, I, I dare to call them, and I know it's a conservative word, but I think psychedelics do install morals. Um, but then on an individual level, what lessons you get for your life, of course, it depends on who you are, where you're at, what your path is, and, and what's next for you. Thank you. Everything you said kind of resonated with me. And very I'm really glad. Nice. And I have this impression that also everything we know about history and mythology is also very patronized. Yes. So kind of very, yes. You know, there's so much yeah. said and mm. written down. So mm. I want, and I, I kind of feel this lack that all the history we know is kind of already in this pattern that we have now. Just yes. History. Yeah. So I wonder if you have any suggestions of where to start, kind of, you know, whatever history or. Mm to look for, you know, the feminine wisdom or feminine powers, anything like where to start, like, yeah, for literacy or something. Mm. Um, Marion Woodman. Is, is a good writer. She's a Jungian analyst. She's a, she's a feminine, and she writes a lot about the feminine. I found her work really, really important. Marion Woodman is the name. And she's interesting to look at um, for, for things. Uh, there's a lot. I mean, um, a lot of stuff I talked about, the static and the feminine, are from Gareth Hill. He's, he's a male Jungian analyst. He's done work on both them. Masculine and the feminine. So for the men that have felt a bit neglected, it's, it, he, he integrates <laughs> both. Um, but uh, yeah, th th there's enormous literature on everything, really. Yeah, but you know, check reference list, this, that, the other, then the path opens. Yeah, this is a gateway drug. <laughs> Questions afterwards too? Uh, I, ha I have a flight yes, very a flight. soon, okay. so I, I have another 15, 20 minutes outside. Yeah. Okay, okay. Mm. So Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.